This is going to be a quick run through of four days compressed into one video. Well, I'm here at a rest stop in Iowa. They're not as fancy as some of the rest stops I saw in Wyoming, South Dakota, but they do have wireless internet. I've never seen that at a state rest stop before. And it's reasonably good speed, three megabytes down. I stopped at a supercharger in Iowa and across the street, I saw this John Deere dealer. So I decided to go pay it a visit. My father started a farm equipment company in South Georgia. Unfortunately, he did not have a John Deere uh, franchise and he ended up going bankrupt. But I've always been interested in farms and farm equipment since then. Well, I'm gonna go into this combine. The tire of this machine is taller than I am. I'd hate to think what it would cost to change the tires. Well, I'm inside the business end of one of these combines. It looks like a jet fighter plane. I know they have GPS and they're integrated with a lot of software that ensures optimum grain handling. This particular combine cost about $600,000 and includes high speed uh, wireless interconnectivity. It's rather hard to imagine how big this machine is and how high off the ground you're sitting. I'm now in Omaha, Nebraska, which is a town of about half a million, and I'm visiting the Durham Museum, which I think it's quite good. I enjoyed this very much. They have a beautifully restored train station and a fascinating collection of statues many of which can actually talk to you. Well, I guess we're not supposed to talk to the project. <laughs> Blue slips sink ships. I may be headed for the Pacific too. There are tin cans in San Diego right now. Are you from Omaha? Council Bluffs. But I spent a lot of time here. Went to Brandeis the first year out of high school. And I come over here, you know, elbows, carcats, dancing at the beanie. I get to some of the Creighton basketball games. Yeah, I was going to Creighton when they called me up. Pre-law. <laughs> yeah, I, I make all the games. I'll miss that. I heard there were... Anyway, you get the drift. It was quite a long conversation, actually. The railroad helped to transform Omaha into one of the fastest growing cities in America. From 1880 to 1890, the area's population tripled, swelling to more than 100,000. But the tide went out with the Depression of 1893, a fiscal mess thicker than Mississippi mud. With the dawn of the 20th century, the city's attitude shifted. A new civic pride found voice in every neighborhood. At the turn of the century, the pictures of photographer Louis Boswick documented the changing city, the birth of Omaha's Union Station, and an art community worthy of the city's newfound culture. Everyone from the packing house laborers. I'm continually impressed at how well dressed people were in those days. I enjoyed my visit to the museum. They had a number of train exhibits, including this restored passenger train, complete with Pullman car, which I walked through and looked at the berth. I remember taking a trip from Atlanta to Washington when my son was young, and we took the train up. It was an overnight sleeper train, but decided to fly back. Unfortunately, unlike the Western trains, trains on the East Coast tend to be run through non-scenic or even worse neighborhoods. I spent the night in St. Joseph, Missouri, and took a quick look at the Pony Express statue. This was an ill-advised adventure that lasted uh, only slightly more than one year, but it did cut the time for messages to travel between the Atlantic and Pacific coast to about 10 days. Unfortunately, uh, slightly more than a year after it started, 
the telegraph line was completed between the coast, which obviated the need for it. Being a Pony Express rider was not one for the timid because you were fighting exhaustion, weather, Indians. One of the most famous riders was William Cody, also known as Buffalo Bill. Well, Snowball and I are at the Supercharger in Independence, Missouri. Six 150 kW units. Over here is a huge Bass Pro Shop, which I think I'm gonna walk over to. It's gonna take out about 20 minutes to charge. I'm not much of an outdoorsman, but I was astounded at the size of this shop. I was told it's only about half the size as the one in Springfield, which is apparently their company headquarters, but it looks like there's scarcely anything you could wish for that you can't find in this store if you're a hunter or a fisherman. To tell you the truth, I really wasn't expecting this, but I cut across a corner of Indiana. One of the things I was really looking forward to on this trip was visiting the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri. It was open not more than a few days ago because I checked on it, but unfortunately when I arrived, it was closed primarily due to COVID. I was really surprised at the scale of the campus for the museum and the scope of the National Park Service in terms of their presence throughout the city, not just here, but in other historic neighborhoods. As you may know, Truman did not receive a pension because presidents were not eligible for that at the time. So he retired to this very modest home in Independence and he famously refused to take any money to serve on boards or in effect to trade on his time as the president. Boy, times have changed. Close to the Truman home is this very different looking structure, which I had to go see what it was, and it turns out it's a Mormon tabernacle. So back on the road and lo and behold, I'm passing over the Missouri River again. I have went back and forth a number of times for these border cities. But it's four lanes, so maybe not. Well, a quick look at uh, Bush Stadium, the home of the St. Louis Cardinals, and then a drive downtown St. Louis. There are some parts of St. Louis that are quite nice and some other areas um, over toward the arch that I was a little bit nervous about, to tell you the truth. So here's the famous St. Louis Arch and Gateway National Park, which is impressive, situated on the waterfront of the Mississippi River with some attractive uh, sculpture, but it's all under construction and it's a little run down at the moment, but when they get through developing it, maybe it'll be quite nice. Mm -hmm. 
After leaving the gateway, I crossed the Mississippi for the final time to bring myself into the eastern part of the United States. It's not a particularly scenic bridge. Coming into Louisville, crossing the Ohio River, I was uh, very interested in going to Churchill Downs, to which I had not been before. It's a pretty impressive place, and they do an excellent job with the museum, and I took a very nice tour. Authentic is tuning in! Authentic and John Velasquez have the lead as they come down to the 16th floor! Authentic! Apparently, the Kentucky Derby is one of the few races that allows 15 horses. And we had a nice view of the track as well. And it actually runs 25 feet deep. Now, this is the same racetrack we have had since 1870. My friend John, who lived many years in Louisville, suggested I take the Versailles exit off the interstate and go by way of the Woodford Reserve distillery and some beautiful uh, horse farms on the way to Lexington. I pulled off at Rocky Top, Tennessee, because I wanted to see some history about the song. Turns out there's nothing that I could find. In fact, the only sign I saw was this liquor store. My route home took me through Knoxville, which is the third largest city in Tennessee and the home of the University of Tennessee. I decided to make a stop at Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, which is one of the uh, main tourist towns adjacent to the Great Smokies National Park. And I wanted to see Dollywood. Who doesn't love Dolly Parton? So they have a very 
nice supercharger facility there, uh, version three, in the parking lot of this new shopping center called Tower Place. It soon became apparent what the purpose of the tower was. They had a number of different kinds of rides. Would you pay money to have this done to you? Well, if not this one, how about a different one where they uh, snatch you up and flip you at the same time? pretty crowded when I was at Pigeon Forge and here's a quick drive down the main street to give you an idea of what it looks like. At the southern end of Pigeon Forge is the road that accesses the Great Smokies National Park. It leads to Newfound Gap, which is the summit, and Cherokee, North Carolina. I saw a number of national parks on my trip, and of all the national parks, by far the most heavily visited one is the Great Smokies National Park with over 12 million visitors. 
Number two is less than half of that, which is the Grand Canyon. Ann and I saw a wonderful six-part series by Ken Burns a number of years ago, but it talks about the formation of our national park systems, how unique it is in the world, and what a wonderful resource it is and will continue to be. The traffic in the park was substantial. Every spot in this parking lot, and there's two others that you can't see, was filled, and every trailhead had cars parked for miles waiting for owners to return from hiking. The energy consumption um, graph on my Tesla was interesting as I climbed up to the top of the mountain. You can see I was using huge amounts of energy and then started regenerating on the way down. This is the observation tower at Klingman's Dome, which is the highest point in the Smokies at uh, 60 643 feet. It's not the highest point in North Carolina. That belongs to Mount Mitchell, which is east of Asheville and is about 40 feet higher. Both of them are about 500 feet taller than Mount Washington, which is the tallest mountain in New England. Later that afternoon, I arrived back in Cashers, North Carolina and entered my subdivision, which is Wade Hampton Golf Club. I'd been gone from home almost four weeks at that point. So it was really nice to see some familiar territory. So finally, snowball rolled into our driveway. I had been gone 5,832 miles, and she was flawless, not a single problem. I felt a little bit like the famous statue, Trails In, which is not actually done by Remington, uh, to my surprise. 